right, so I'm going to begin today with a rather long story uh, that's going to tie into the theme of our passage today in Matthew chapter 9. Now, some of you know I grew up in Tampa, which is the home of the Bucks, Bush Gardens, and beautiful Bayshore Boulevard. And so believe it or not, Bayshore has the longest continuous sidewalk in the entire world. It's by far uh, one of my favorite places, if not my favorite place, to run, which I try to do whenever I visit my mom, who lives just a few minutes uh, from that gorgeous picture there. Tampa is also called the lightning capital of North America. And so like many Florida cities, including PSL, it's known for its sudden storms and torrential downpours. And so if you're in Tampa and dark clouds begin to form, you know it's time to get indoors as soon as possible because you don't want to get caught in that. Now, I'm the youngest of three boys in our family. So my big brother, Matt, you guys all know him or most of you know him. He's our head of school at Calvary Christian Academy. Uh, my, my older brother, Mark, he lives in Annapolis, Maryland, and he is a, um, a managing director at Deloitte. Uh, consulting there in Annapolis, and then there's yours truly. And so um, Matt, Mark, and Mike. By the way, we just celebrated my brother Matt's birthday this past week. He is 61 years old. My brother Mark, yeah, praise the Lord, right? My brother Mark has just turned 60. They're in their 60s. I'm still in my mid-50s. That's a wonderful thing. I, I tell you, I I hated being the youngest growing up, but I love it now because I am the youngest. And in our age, you want to be the youngest. So when I was around eight, Mark was around 11, Matt was around 12. Eight, 11, and 12, we were hanging out at our neighborhood park there in South Tampa. And so as we're having a good time together, all of a sudden we looked up and dark clouds <laughs> began to quickly uh, form out of nowhere in the sky, which meant, meant we need to get home quick. Now, earlier, for whatever reason, I decided to walk to the park. My brothers decided to ride their bikes. And so now, with the storm bearing down on us, there's three kids, two bikes. So I decided I'm going to hitch a ride with my brother Mark. I'm going to jump on his handlebars as we hightail at home. And so back in the early 70s, bikes had great accessories some of you guys remember this, including the flag in the back. And so the adults said the flag was for safety. We kids, we just knew that it was just cool, right? And so somehow Mark's flag at the park had come off. So he asked me to hold it as I'm sitting on the handlebars and we're heading home. So here we are, three brothers, hightailing at home, trying to get home before we got drenched. I'm on Mark's handlebars. I'm holding the flag. And then it happened. So while I wasn't paying attention, daydreaming, which I did a lot as a kid, I allowed the bottom of the flag to get stuck in the spokes of the front wheel. And just like that, the front wheel locked and we went flying. And so I went over first, landing face first in the pavement. My brother Mark came behind me in midair and he his rear end landed on the back of my head, driving my face further down into the street. Now, because my arm was situated like this, when Mark came down, it snapped. And I wasn't even aware of it because I was out cold. So there I am, lying unconscious on Clark Street, there in South Tampa, not far from our house, and my brothers start yelling, Dad, Mom, right? Because we're, now we're only a couple blocks away. Dad, Mom, right? By the way, Mark was fine because he had a cushion. <laughs> Me. But my dad and my mom hear the commotion. And my dad shot out of the house like a bullet. And he was really in great shape back in those days, in the early 70s. My dad, they tell me later, was running. He passed my mom, right? And he, with one single bound, leapt over the front yard fence. It was at me with 15 sec uh, 20 seconds flat. Scoops me up in his arms, and he begins to run back home with me. Well, somehow, in all the commotion, they let the front door lock. So now the door is locked, so he's got to go around to the side door, which is a screen door that's hooked from the inside, and it's locked. Then my mom got into the action. All four foot 11 of her 
And she grabs that, I tell you, adrenaline, something else. She grabs the screen door and with one yank, she pulled the hook out of the wall. Problem solved. We went inside and they needed to clean me up because of my head wound. Um, They had to clean up all the blood. Now, I just want to pause right here and just say, man, our dad was a great guy. There he is right there uh, in a picture with my niece and nephew, Molly and, and Ethan. And there he is rejoicing over his big catch, rejoicing because he loved to fish. Fishing was only second in his book to golfing. That was his greatest passion was golfing. But my dad was a super outgoing, super positive guy. And, and listen to this. He had the gift. Some of you guys know people like this. He had the gift of making people feel great. That was my dad. And we really miss him. So, yeah, <laughs> praise God, right? So back to the story, uh, back in the 70s, dad and I used to watch WWF wrestling. Now it's WWE. And um, sometimes those matches, if you remember, uh, were pretty bloody. So we're back in the bathroom, right? I'm going in and out of consciousness. My mom's trying to clean up my face. And then I remember waking up for a few seconds, and I, and I, I remember seeing my dad. And he had me held up in front of the mirror And smiling ear to ear, he says something like, look, son, you're a WWF wrestler, right? (laughs) That was my dad. Now, Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen, listen, you can make a choice in your life. You can either be a thermostat or you can be a thermometer. You can be a thermostat where you decide what the environment around you is going to be like, or you can be a victim You can be a thermometer where you allow other people to dictate your mood or how you're going to feel that day. And I want to encourage you and myself, can we please be thermometers? Can we please be more outgoing and friendly and encouraging to other people? And you might say, well, you don't know what I went through. Well, listen, my dad went through a lot. He did two or three tours to Vietnam. He went through hell. And yet, he was this guy that was so outgoing and so encouraging. You know what? My dad could have freaked out when all that stuff was happening with me. And that would have negatively affected the whole family. As the leader, he could have freaked out and negatively affected the whole family. Or later on, he could have been really mean and scolded me, right, uh, for being so foolish. He could have said, son, how many times have I told you? You don't ride on the handlebars. You never listen to me. And now look what happened, right? He could have done that, but that wasn't my dad. That wasn't my dad at all. Now, he was a disciplinarian. He spent 22 years in the military. Of course, of course he was a disciplinarian, right? But here's, here's the thing. More times than not, if you messed up, instead of coming down on you, he would, have fig- he would figure out a way to help you. Now, that was so good. I'm going to say that one again. More than not, more often than not, if you messed up, instead of coming down on you, my dad would figure out a way to help you. And so when I regained consciousness again, I found myself in the hospital. And I was glad uh, that in the hospital, the medical staff there in the hospital was like my dad. I don't remember them ever scolding me. I don't remember the nurses ever lecturing me on proper bike safety. I don't remember them ever tisking and shaking their head and shaming me for being foolish. No, at the hospital, they welcomed me. And not only that, they carefully stitched up my head, and then they carefully set my broken bone, and then they carefully put a cast on my arm. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going somewhere with this, but but listen, if you're listening, say amen here. At the hospital, I received the best of care. Now, when I got out of the hospital, I was messed up. I mean, I looked like Rocky Balboa after he lost to Apollo Creed, right? When I went to Mass that weekend, because I grew up Catholic, I went forward for communion, and the, my face was so messed up, the priest later told my mom that when your son came up, he didn't know where to put the host. It was like, the body of Christ. <laughs> right? He just didn't know where to, where to put it, because I was, I was messed up for a while. Now, about eight years later, so now we're around 1982, I'm 16 years old, I go to the theater, 
I watched Rocky III, and I fell in love with boxing. And so my dad found out he hung a heavy bag in the backyard for me, and I started going crazy on that heavy bag. I bought a double end bag. I bought a speed bag. I was running down Bayshore. Doing, I literally was doing one-arm push-ups on Bayshore, just like Rocky, right? And I started training so much. I was training in the rain. I took it to an extreme, and I ended up in the hospital. Now, this time, I'm in the hospital for 11 days with double pneumonia. But here's what I, what I experienced as a junior in high school. These people treated me like world, royalty. Again, at the hospital, guess what? I received the best of care. In fact, as I think back at all, at all the hospital visits that I've experienced, and on top of that, all the hospital visits I've made as a pastor for 24 years now, I've been in the hospital a lot. And the vast majority of time, in fact, every single time except for one, we won't talk about that one, right? But every single time I've been in a hospital environment, I've had a positive experience. Whenever I've gone to the hospital, I've always encountered people who were thoughtful and caring and competent. Now, we often in this church, we recognize our military vets and our law enforcement officers, and rightfully so. We should do that. But as I was writing the message this week, typing the message this week, it, it dawned on me that at Calvary for 20 years, we've never recognized our medical professionals. <laughs> and I, I'm thinking, man, we need to do that today. All right, so if you're here today and you're in any way, shape, or form involved in the medical field, can you please stand up right now and remain standing so we can thank you for what you do in your life? Yeah, let's really give it up for these people. This is awesome, right? This is amazing. And so, thank you guys. You guys can, you guys can be, be seated, but I just want to say on behalf of our church family, thanks for being there when we were down and out. Thanks for being there when we were hurting. Thank you for your thoughtfulness and your care and your competency, competency and your chosen career in life. God is using you in a really big way. Now, also, as I'm typing out my message this week, I asked myself this question. Here's the question. How amazing would it be if our churches looked like hospitals? How amazing would it be if our churches looked more, more like hospitals than museums? You see, Webster defines hospital as, quote, an institution where the ill or injured may receive care and food and lodging, whereas a museum, quote, is an institution used for exhibiting artistic, historical, or scientific objects. All right, so every single church in the entire world this morning either resembles a hospital or a museum. They either represented a hospital, right, where hurting people can be cared for, or they represent a museum where proud people go to be admired. Churches that are like hospitals are made up of spirit-indwelt, spirit-filled, caring people, but churches that are like museums, well, they're just made up of spiritually dead, self-righteous people. Spiritually alive people in hospital churches, they love to gather together like you guys did a little while ago, and they love to worship and admire the Lord who's worthy of our praise. But in spiritually dead, hospital-like churches, self-righteous people, they like going to church not so much to admire the Lord, but to be admired themselves. Spiritually alive people in hospital churches love going to church to serve others. Self-righteous people in museum churches, they like to go and they like to be served themselves. In spiritually alive churches, well, those hospital churches, they welcome sinners. But in these museum kind of like churches, well, you know what they do? They shun sinners. And if somebody falls into sin, what happens is that these self-righteous people, they harshly criticize them when they mess up. When somebody falls into sin in this kind of church, you know what happens is spiritually alive people gather around them, and if those people are willing, they seek 
to humbly restore them in a spirit of humility. Kind of like what you read in Galatians 6, 1 in the Word of God, where it says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness and keep watch on yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the loss the, 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 the uh, law of Christ, right? And so somebody falls in this kind of church, you know what happens is they're surrounded with people who are not doing this to them. They're surrounded with like the nurses who carefully set my bone. They're trying to, if they're willing, they're trying to gently restore them and they're watching themselves because how many of you guys know everybody in this room, myself included, all of us are capable of doing any sin in the book, so we should have humble attitudes as opposed to these people over here in museum churches who just like to harshly criticize with an arrogant attitude and berate people when they fall. And we've had our, our, our plenty of, of, of um, religious figures, right, and, and pastors who have fallen, right? And that breaks my heart. But you know what breaks my heart as much is the Christians over here who love to just harshly gossip and criticize those people who fall. And ladies and gentlemen, man, we got to change our attitude. And we got to decide who are we going to pattern ourselves after in this church? Are we going to pattern ourselves after Jesus? Or are we going to pattern ourselves after the Pharisees who we're going to see in a minute when we get into the text? Now, I think everybody knows in this room that Jesus was the most loving person who ever walked the earth in the history of mankind. And because he's the most loving person who ever walked the earth, he would consistently treat people with thoughtfulness, care, and competency. And we got to do the same. And not only that, listen to this, Jesus would treat despised sinners and outcasts of society in the same way. With thoughtfulness, care, and competency, and we should do the same. Now in our text today, a scandalous thing occurred in terms of first century religious Judaism. Jesus actually calls an outcast. He calls a despised sinner to follow him And then he attended a party with a bunch of that guy's friends. And it's going to cause the museum Christians, not Christians, but the museum religious guys called the Pharisees, um, it's going to cause their heads to explode. Now I'm talking about the tax collector Matthew, who left everything to follow Jesus. All right, so who was Matthew? Well, long before he wrote the gospel that we've been studying now for weeks, Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew collected taxes for the world power of that day. You guessed it, the Roman Empire, who, by the way, the Jews loathed. The Jews hated the Roman Empire, and there was only one other group of people they hated more, and that's tax collectors, especially Jewish tax collectors like Matthew. They, they, they hated Matthew. They despised Matthew. Here's why. It's because Matthew was a Jew. Matthew was just like them, right? He's an Israelite. And yet, Matthew has the audacity to collect taxes from them for the enemy. And this drove the Jews absolutely insane. You see, in that day, tax collectors had a really bad reputation, The Romans would give tax collectors like Matthew a certain quota they had to meet in a certain amount of time. And if if these tax collectors would receive more revenue than the quota that the Roman Empire gave them, a lot of these guys would pocket, they would keep the revenue for themselves. And that's why Jewish tax collectors were not only considered traitors to Israel, they were also considered crooks. Because these guys, guys like Matthew, they were getting rich off the backs of their own countrymen. Now, I know you know the answer to this, but help me out. Every once in a while, I like to hear you guys, okay? So how do you think the Jewish religious community 
How do you think they treated Matthew? Good or bad? Really bad. Really bad. Ladies and gentlemen, as I studied, local synagogues excommunicated tax, Jewish tax collectors. What does that mean? That if you're a Jewish tax collector in the first century, that means that you're not allowed to go to church on Saturday. They excommunicated Jewish tax collectors. They ostracized um, these guys from the religious community. But how do you guys think Jesus treated Matthew? Let's look at Matthew 9, 9. Let's find out. So right now, if you're looking at Matthew 9, 9, just say amen so I know you're there. Okay, so as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth and he said to him, you disgust me. Is that what it says, everybody? So he sees Matthew sitting at the tax booth and he says to him, follow me. And Matthew arose (laughs) and he followed him. Now, since Matthew worked in Capernaum, which is the ministry headquarters of Jesus, I've showed you that on the map, right? Northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus um, lived. That's where Jesus had his ministry headquarters. Well, Matthew collected, collected taxes in Capernaum. So this isn't like a stranger walks up and says, follow me, and Matthew walks away. No, 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 Matthew was well aware of Jesus. No doubt, Matthew had already heard a number of Jesus' amazing sermons. He had already seen a number of Jesus' amazing miracles. So when this extraordinary rabbi comes up to the tax booth and he says, follow me, listen, Matthew left everything and followed Jesus. Now, one of the reasons that we love Jesus so much is that he was so different. I mean, refreshingly different. And here's how in this text. Jesus was refreshingly different because when other people in the Jewish community shunned Matthew and ostracized Matthew, Jesus wants to hang out with them. Man, you got to get this this morning. Because this is going to determine the reputation that we have going forward as a church. So let me say that again. I love Jesus. You love Jesus. One of the reasons we love him, he's so refreshingly different. And one of the ways that he was different in this text was that while the the religious people were shunning Matthew, Jesus wants to hang out with Matthew to the point that he calls Matthew to follow him. That leads you to your next point if you're taking notes today. Ladies and gentlemen, super easy, super practical um, this morning, but no matter who you are or what you've done, you need to know that Jesus loves you, he died for you, and he wants you to follow him. Now, when the Jews saw Matthew in the tax booth, do you know what they saw? They saw a traitor. They saw a crook. But when Jesus, you got to hear this, because this is going to determine, as a church, what our reputation is in this community moving forward. When the Jews saw Matthew in the tax booth, they saw a traitor and they saw a crook. But when Jesus saw Matthew in the tax booth, he saw a man made in the image of God. And not only that, he saw a man that he loved, and that's why he said, follow me. What's the application? No matter who you are or what you've done, you need to know that Jesus loves you. He died for you, and he wants you to follow him. Now, I love this point because, ladies and gentlemen, we are right now at what? August, I can't see, August 18th or 19th, right? 18th, right? And so the next September, October, November, the next three months are going to be really contentious in our nation. Really contentious. I mean, I think we're already so divided. I think we're going to see this more than we've ever seen it before. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a choice as number one followers of Jesus 
as opposed to followers of any political party. Number one, as followers of Jesus, we have a choice, church family. We can be either be part of the problem or we can be part of the solution in the next three months. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that we can, and it breaks my heart to see people whose policies I wholeheartedly agree with and I love, right, but who resort to personal attacks and demonizing the other side. And I get it. Like, like many of you, I sit at night sometimes and I watch the news and I want to throw my remote at my flat screen, but I know how much I paid for that thing, right? So I, I don't do it. But, but I get it. I get, right, the frustration. But ladies and gentlemen, listen, we can speak the truth in, you tell me, love. We can actually go through the next three months obeying the Sermon on the Mount, <laughs> And I think be more effective than a lot of the people who may agree with us on policy, but resort to name calling, backbiting, and personal vicious attacks. We have a choice as far as how we're going to treat people. We can either look at them through the eyes of the Jewish community and how they looked at Matthew, or we can choose to look through the eyes of Jesus and see people as people who've been made in the image of God, as human beings who the Lord loves. And so the question is this, will you do what Matthew has done? Will you follow Jesus? But someone says, but you don't understand, Pastor, I'm an alcoholic. Or you don't understand, Pastor, I'm a junkie. Or you don't understand, Pastor, I'm a thief. And I would say to you this morning, Okay, but just as Jesus looked at Matthew, a tax collector, and he still loved him and called him, when he sees you, he sees a person who's made in the image of God, a person he loves, and he wants, like Matthew, he wants you, no matter who you are or what you've done, he wants you to follow him. Okay, somebody says, but you don't understand. I'm addicted to porn. I'm an adulterer. I have cheated on my spouse, or uh, I'm a practicing homosexual. And I would say, okay, but, but here's what you need to hear. Just as Jesus looked at Matthew, a tax collector, and he still loved him and called him, when he looks at you, he sees a person who's been made in the image of God, he sees a person that he loves, and he wants you to follow him. I don't care who you are or what you've done. He wants you to follow him. And somebody says, well, you don't understand. I had an abortion. Or I'm a guy. In the past, I pushed my girlfriend to have an abortion. Or I used to work at or volunteer at an abortion clinic. And I would say, okay. But here's what you need to know. Just as Jesus looked at Matthew, a tax collector, and he still loved him and called him when he looks at you. Again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm repeating myself because we are under so much shame and so much under guilt and so much condemnation. Sometimes you got to drive the hammer harder and harder to get through to a person's heart. So when Jesus looks at you, here's what he sees. At the risk of sounding redundant, here's what Jesus sees. He sees a person made in God's image, who he loves, and he wants you to follow him. So the question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to do what Matthew did? Are you, key moment in the message, are you going to turn? Can you please say the word turn? Turn. Like Matthew, are you going to turn your back on your old life and follow Jesus? That's the question. Look at verse 10. It says, and as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, got to get this, many tax collectors. Now, can we just pause real quick? And let me just say, we in 2024 Western society have no idea the impact of what's happening in this verse. Unless you're um, 
a Bible scholar or a theologian, you've done the cultural background, historical background, we don't get it. Okay, and so you say, yeah, I get it. I don't like the IRS. Well, okay, you don't like the IRS, but, but, but listen, that's like here <laughs> in terms of intensity, but what we're reading right now, it's through that ceiling. Again, they hated tax collectors, especially Jewish tax collectors. And where's Jesus? Right in the middle of the despised outcasts of society. So again, in verse 10, as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many, not just a few, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus, hanging out, and his disciples. And so from the parallel passage in Luke's gospel, we discover that this is Matthew's home. So no doubt it's a large and beautiful home because Matthew's a wealthy guy. And what I love about Matthew is that after he made his decision, follow me, turns his back on his old way of life, he starts to follow Jesus. After Matthew made that decision, he threw a party in his home so his friends could meet the Lord. Now, here's the application point, the next point, very simple and basic this morning. Jesus hung out with sinners to eventually win them over to a new way of life, and we should too. And so I love the fact that Jesus used Matthew so that he could meet Matthew's friends. If you're listening right now, can you say amen here? But have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus wants to use you so he can meet your friends? It's a real powerful picture, what we're reading today in the text. And if you, like Matthew, if you've made a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, here's what I know. I know you want your friends to follow him. You want your friends who don't know the Lord. You want your friends who are unchurched people, right? Going their own way, going their own way, doing their own thing. You want your friends to come to know the Lord. The reason I know that is because I'm born again like you're born again. We know how awesome Jesus is. We know how Jesus changes lives. And we know that if we can get people to just hang out with Jesus, eventually, now a lot of times it doesn't happen right away, we gotta be patient, but eventually he, not us, right? We're vessels that he uses and it's important, right, that we have the right um, character and reputation, but, but more than that, a billion times more than that, it's the Holy Spirit, but we know if somebody would just hang out with Jesus, eventually, he's going to win them over to a new way of life, all right? And so somebody might say, but pastor, you don't get it. All my friends are Christians. And I would say, if that's true, we got a problem. We got a big problem because the Lord said in Matthew 5 that we are the salt of the earth, Matthew said in, I'm sorry, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, we are the light of the world, okay? And so as the salt of the earth, what does he want to do? He wants to shake us over other people's lives. And then as the light of the world, right, as his lights in this world, what does he want to do? He wants to shine us on people's lives, okay? But we can't, we can't, we can't, we can't shake or shine if we don't have anybody to shake and shine on. Does that make sense to you guys? So if all of our friends are Christians, then who are we gonna shake on? Who are we gonna shine on? Said another way, if you wanna rub shoulders with more lost people in your life, right, check out this list. Here's a real practical list. And by the way, everybody can just look at me real quick. I just want you, I don't ever want to, I don't ever, ever, ever want to have this air as I'm preaching that I'm up here and I've got it all figured out and you guys are down here and I'm preaching down at you like I've, I have a perfect life. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't ever allow the enemy to whisper that lie into your ear. I am one of you. So as I say sometimes, as I'm going like this, I've got three fingers pointing back at me. Seen in the fact, number one, get to know your neighbors. I am 
a person who lives in the same culture you live in, we're all busy, right? By the way, some of you guys think pastors golf all week. (laughs) Give me a break. I work six days a week and I work hard and I'm busy, right? And so um, in this era of busyness and in this era of safety, I, like many of you, I'm driving down the street, coming to my house, I pull in the driveway, I hit the remote, the door goes up, I go in, I hit the the, the button and it goes down behind me. And a lot of times I don't have any interaction at all with my neighbors. So again, three are coming back at me. So we all got to work on this list. But we should get to know our neighbors. Another embarrassing thing happened to me three weeks, three, four weeks ago. And that is that we get a knock on the door on a Sunday afternoon and there's three uh, beautiful little girls, um, I think a teenager, a middle school, an elementary, I'm not sure. um, And they have brownies for my wife and I with a little card that talks about, um, we're so grateful that you're our pastor. And I'm like, who are you? (laughs) They live four houses down. I didn't even know they went to this church. Yeah, so I'm just trying trying to let you know that we all need this, okay? So we should get to know our neighbors. And by the way, um, you probably can come up with 50 other points. These are just what I brainstormed this week. Here's another idea. If you want to shake and shine more, you want to rub shoulders more with people who don't know the Lord, try coaching your kid's sports team. And by the way, uh, some of you guys like me come from legalistic churches. I was in fundamentalist churches for uh, about 10 years of my life. And thank God in those churches, I learned the word of God. And I'm not trying to bash other churches, but but, but here's here's what we were taught in a lot of those environments that when you meet someone, you got to share the Lord with them, the whole gospel, first meeting. And there was so much pressure on us to do that, and it kind of messed me up a little bit in my head, right? Um, and, and so thank God I got into more grace-filled churches later, and I realized that Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God's the one who gives the increase. You don't have to share the whole gospel every time you meet somebody. You can just be yourself, be loving, be like my dad, right? Um, A thermostat, not a thermometer, be a positive influence, plant seeds. And then um, at at, at some time, remember, it's the Holy Spirit that leads them to the Lord. So get to know your neighbors. Coach your kids' sports team. Here's an idea. Join a martial arts or fitness class. You say, that one's not for me. Could you please move on? Okay. Okay. When you play golf or fish or whatever you men and women like to do, invite a friend who doesn't know the Lord. Just hang out with them. And then invite a friend to your Calvary group. I love this one because as people drive down 25th Street, they see all the cars, right, in the parking lot. Most of them are unchurched. Listen, most of them have never set foot in a church in their life. So they don't know what we're doing in here. They, they probably think because of stuff that they've heard, and some of those, oops, I almost said the S word, S-T-U word, not the other, okay, I'm sorry, we'll take that out of the tape, but they've seen some of the dumb movies in the past that depicted evangelicals like, oh my goodness, how do I say this? Like crazy people, yeah, got to be really careful as I'm talking up here. So they've seen movies that depict evangelicals like crazy people, so they're driving down the street, they don't know what's going on here. They're not going to come in here initially but they may go to your house. It's less awkward, less intimidating. And so maybe invite a friend to your Calvary group or another idea is join our outreach team. So Matt Messiano, Pastor Matt Messiano is over reach in our church, which means in reach and outreach. So he's over in reach, which is care, um, um, benevolence, um, um, hospital visits, marriages, funerals, um, counseling, right, and on and on and on. So he's, he's over that. Uh, JR uh, is, is working with Matt now in that department, praise the Lord. And we have other elders that are helping out. And, so, and then we also have local outreach in our community and we have global outreach, which is missions, right? We have this outreach team that we're gonna start to build and we would love for you to be part of it. And one of the many things that they're gonna do is that starting in January, every single month, this outreach team is going to go to a park somewhere in Port St. Lucie, and they're going to set up really cool, fun child games, 
and they're going to um, invite people to come. Kids are going to come, right? They're going to wear the gospel bracelet. They're going to develop relationships and have an opportunity to share Jesus with the parents and the kids. And that's a beautiful thing. So there's so many ways that we can shake and we can shine. I'm sure you can add to the list, but if you want to serve on our outreach team, just go to our website, Next Steps, and serve on a team. You fill out the form and we'll get a hold of you. But, but this is important too. So right now, if you're listening, say amen here. Amen. Okay, got to get this. As you're meeting people, don't feel like you got to agree with them on everything before you develop a relationship with them. Again, I come from a background and so many times it was like, you got to live this separated life, right? And so don't hang out with these people because they're going to be a bad influence on you. You got to be separated, right? And so I get some of that, but man, we took it to an extreme and it was embarrassing. So ladies and gentlemen, as we're meeting people, don't feel like you got to agree with them before you develop a relationship with them. If that's how you think, you're never going to have any friends, Christian or non-Christian. Do you guys really think that Jesus agreed with the lifestyles of these tax collectors at this party? Yes or no? No, of course not. But he hung out with them. He talked with them. He got to know them. <laughs> and we should do the same. Now, if you start to live like this, there are certain people over here in the museum who are going to get mad and they're going to start pushing back on you. And they're going to quote verses at you, like James 4.4. 4. Enmity, I'm sorry, friendship with the world is enmity with God. I heard a lot of that in the past. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, right? And they use it in a way to say that you should be separate and not hang out with these people. But ladies and gentlemen, that's not the context at all. If you read the verses before, the verses after James 4, 4, James is just telling Christians like us to make sure that we're not living like the world, to make sure we don't have worldly lives. In other words, have you ever heard this? Be in the world, but not of it. But you still got to be in the world, I am so glad that in my BC days, there was people who just got to know me and they didn't try to agree with me on everything and they were patient with me. And, and so we should have that attitude. And then as the Lord opens the door, we share the love of Jesus with that person. You say, how do I know when that's gonna happen? You'll know. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will lead. It'll be so, so obvious. And please, when you talk about the Lord, be proud of the Lord. I guarantee you, Matthew was beaming with pride, so proud of the Lord as he's introducing his friends to Jesus at the party that day. So if we live this way like Matthew, if we live like Matthew, next slide, we are rubbing shoulders with unbelievers in our lives. We're getting to know them even if we don't agree with them. We're at the right opportune time sharing Christ's love with them and then as we're doing that, we are proud of the Lord because we know how the Lord changes lives for the better. And so, again, if you live that way, you're going to get some opposition. Enter now the narrative again, the party poopers. Please look at verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat? with tax collectors and sinners. But when he heard it, Jesus, he said to the Pharisees, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, you never stump Jesus. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means, religious people. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners, and Luke tells us, but sinners to repentance. So what is Jesus doing here? He's quoting Hosea 6.6 6 at the Bible scholars. He knows this is the world they live in. He quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. What does that mean? You look it up in the Hebrew, you look at the word mercy, here's what it means. Here's a paraphrase. I desire steadfast love more than religious rituals. I desire mercy, steadfast love, more than over here in the museum, these empty religious rituals. 
And the Pharisees were so focused on dotting every religious I and crossing every religious T, but they had no compassion and no concern for people who needed the Lord. These Pharisees are like relics in the museum. And the only reason they go to synagogue, right, is so that they can be admired by other people. And in their hubris and their pride, they don't get it. They don't get it. They don't get it that needy people need a doctor. They need people like the people who stood up a little while ago, compassionate, caring, and competent. And so, again, my prayer is at Calvary PSL that we have a reputation of being a church that's a hospital and never a church that's a museum, that we have a reputation where thoughtful and caring and competent people welcome sinners, welcome people who are maybe even the outcasts and despised of society, right, and we give them the help that they need. Now in closing, I I can't share a message like this without sharing about our amazing ministry, Celebrate Recovery. And so ladies and gentlemen, Celebrate Recovery, yeah, we should clap. It's an awesome ministry. As you see, every Thursday night, 6.30, they are here, right here in this room. Every single Thursday night, I think there's two or three in the year where they're not, but every single Thursday night. It's a Christ-centered ministry It's designed to help people, not just with alcohol or drugs, it's designed to help people who, with all these hurts and habits and hangups. And what I love about CR is that they teach biblically-based recovery principles, and it all revolves around this um, Christ-centered, Christian-based 12-step recovery program. And so if you want more information about CR, you can go to our website, right, or Better yet, right after Andrew closes in prayer, Pastor Andrew, you can go out right over there. Um, You'll see a Celebrate Recovery flag, and there's a CR rep today that would love to talk to you, answer any questions that you had. Here's what I know for sure, that if you have the courage to walk in this door on a Thursday night at 630, you are not going to find a museum atmosphere. You're going to find a hospital. One time, somebody said to evangelist and pastor Greg Laurie. The only reason you follow Jesus is because you need a crutch. And Greg Laurie looked back at the person and said, no, actually, I need a whole hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, that's us. If you have the thought in your mind that I don't need Jesus because I don't need a crutch, as long as you maintain that thought, you can never be saved. Why? Because God said in his word, a humble and a contrite spirit, I will not despise. Because God says in his words, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble.